Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. Let me disabuse people of this idea that the new generation is lazy. Of course they're lazy uh, kids out there, but they always have been. I mean, there's a thing you can read where this essay, where the youth of today, you know, uh, are basically slackers and don't take anything serious and, you know, dragging society down and was written by Socrates. Okay. So, (laughs) you know, the, the youth have always been accused of being sorry, but there are some unbelievable young people out there, uh, coming up in just about every company I look at. So anybody who's, who's hanging on to that idea, uh, uh, you know, let it go. Because there's some really sharp people out there. And I'm sure you run into them. And, uh, let, let, let me add something to that, Larry. So, you know, there's a... a, a... I read about this before. World War I Ger- Germany, a German general was saying this. He's like, bring me to soldiers that are that not necessarily the ones that work hard, but are like average average intelligence, but you want the ones that are lazy and smart. And even I think even Bill Gates said this before to you. The, the, the truly deadly people are, are the ones that are lazy and smart because they're gonna figure things out and they're gonna figure out shortcuts. Yeah. Remind, reminds me of our mantra we had when I was at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, you know, we're casting forward saying we're we're looking for jobs. And mine was, I want I want one where you go to work at 11 a.m., you have lunch, you have a two-hour lunch at 12, then you come back in for a nap in the afternoon and then go home. You know, that was <laughs> I was never impressed by the people with uh that are working the hundred hour work weeks, which we all have, you know, I've done that. That doesn't impress me. You know, in fact, anybody gets up and said in a, in a conference or someone speaking, said, you know, you got to work hard. It's like, what are you, an idiot? Of course, you, you, you think you're giving news to people. Uh, you got to work hard. But the people I'm impressed by is the ones who can get tons of it done. And they don't seem to be breaking a sweat because those are the people that are going to keep uh, doing it. And uh, they've got even bigger capacity in the future. You know, so uh, uh, I'm kind of I've always had the sa- same viewpoint, Eric. When you uh, you're coming up now, you're learning things and, you know, you're excited, but you're working with people. What are you learning about? Did you were all of your people experiences positive, you know, coming up or did you go through some things? I, you know, when I was uh, my first job out of uh, heck. I went to work for, I, I learned about people. In fact, I learned what a manic depressive personality was and uh, not, not a fun experience. I learned that by having acid in my stomach every time I got around my boss, you know, and uh, uh, you, <laughs> you learn to survive in those situations. Did you, uh, we, you know, we're, I'm sure you, most of, most all your experiences were, were positive, but did, did you learn about uh, some life lessons working with people along the way. Absolutely, and I think anybody that says they haven't is probably well, their brain's probably not very uh, active. And I say that in a, in a kind way because um, you know sometimes medical conditions, right? So, right. I would just say, yeah, for the most part, I believe that the vast majority of people are kind, and you know everyone's going through something. But yeah, absolutely, I've I've learned lessons not not even just from other people working with other people, but also. Myself, you know, being the quote unquote boss, right? Like that's a, right. still a weird term to me. Yeah. But, you know, what, the main thing I've learned is that every personality is different. And also, not only just Larry, there's like not just one version of you, there's millions of versions of you or hundreds of thousands of versions of you because you met that many people. Right. And so, you, you know, people are getting you at different times. You, you might be in a different mood, different point in your career. And so, you know, I've learned that all I can do on my end is, is try to put my best foot forward and that I'm going to be wrong sometimes. And that's okay because we're human. Yeah. And so where, you know, did you have any experiences that really stung early in your career 
Uh, you know, the old football coach at Ohio State, Woody Hayes, said, there's nothing that sobers you up quite like getting, you know, going out in a game and getting your head knocked off and beat by three or four touchdowns, you know. There's nothing quite so sobering as going through one of those experiences. But did you have any kind of really sobering type experience like that where things did not work out the way you expected and but you you know a great learning experience yeah i mean anybody that says they haven't um they haven't really been through much just being honest but one of the ones that i can recall earlier in my career was when i was around uh i think it was 25 or so that was when i was leading marketing at this startup and a month into the job the ceo pulled me aside and said hey if you don't hit numbers this month we're gonna have to let you go and that was a crossroads in my career where it's like one on one side, it's like, I can be like, are, are you freaking kidding me? Like, I just, I just got here. Like, are you like, are you dumb? Like it, it takes time to figure this stuff out. And then the other side is like, well, like you can figure it out and you know, and it'll be a great lesson. It'll be a great story. And so what did I do exactly? Okay. You're going to let me go. I bet the entire company on YouTube advertising and that skyrocketed us. Um, it skyrocketed our we were acquiring way more users, like 10 times the amount of users that we were acquiring before. And that led to us raising our Series B and the company continuing to grow. So that was one instance. Um, and then I'll share one more real quick. It's, you know, when I took over the ad agency single grain when I was 27, it might sound amazing, but no, I actually made the company go from bad to worse because when I came into the company, I thought my poo poo didn't stink because I worked in tech and right. I didn't try to build any rapport with anybody. I read a book called, let my people go surfing from the Patagonia co-founder, which is a great book, by the way. But then I took it too literally. I was like, oh yeah, let my people go surfing. So I stopped showing up to the office. <laughs> and what ended up happening next is everything fell down and we dropped all the way down to one employee. And my outside accounting firm called me and said, hey, I think it's time to shut it down. And um, that was another moment. So, Yeah. And so as you're, you, you move on, uh, you know, we learned... Some of these things you just have to go through them. Or they, you know, and either you're going to come up with the idea, the half baked idea, or someone's going to try and talk you into it. So a lot of these things, and and let's face it, there may be a time where it's smart for you not to go to the office, you know. And uh, uh, I know I switched gears back in '83, where every time I went to the office, everybody was like, it seemed like when I pulled into the parking lot. Two levels down, and we were up on the fifth floor. By the time I would pulled into and the car came to a stop in the parking lot, people would rush out of air and come to me with problems. What do I do about this? What do I do with that? I've got someone over here I want you to talk to. How do we handle this? You know, and they're just all over me. And so, <laughs> you know, you get there in the morning, and by the time you raised your head, you notice it's like eight o'clock at night. And you got nothing done that you want to do. So I shifted at that point. I shifted where I, I made a decision. I'm never in the office unless it's a meeting. And I had my secretary bring all the mail and meet me over at the uh, breakfast place. And she would shove. If there was something, she would tell me what she needed to tell me. If it was something for me to sign, she would push it across the table to me. I'd sign it and I'd push it back. But I didn't have any paper around me. But uh, that's the only way I could stay in control of my life. So there are times where don't go to the office is the right thing, but not without having controls in place and rendezvous. And uh, uh, But you have to go through that and learn what's going to work for uh, for you. And uh, uh, I noticed there's a but Are those games behind you on your shelves? Are those books? Or those books. would be those would be books. Okay, books. Okay, I can't I can't tell. And so you must be quite a reader, Harry. Yeah, I mean, um, well, going back to your point real quick, it's uh, you know, you eventually you learn how to delegate, and eventually you learn how to coach people. It's like instead of bringing all the problems to you, oh, oh what would you do about it? Yeah. And if they can't figure it out, you probably have the wrong person, right? But I'll I digress. So these are all these are all books back here. I actually have, um, and I have these two statues of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger over here that I'm supposed to put back okay. up. But I, um, you know, one of my core values is... Where do you get those statues, by the way? Uh, one of my friends sells them for, they're, they're like 
fifteen hundred each. Um, but really? if you just type in uh, Warren Buffett bronze bust, you should be able to find it. Okay, and I think you it, sell some of those. those. That sounds like a pretty cool idea. Yeah, yeah. I, it 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 reminds me to be patient and and you know and have fun, right? Because they're still they're in their nineties and they're having fun. So and to drink a co- and to drink Coca Cola and have and McDonald's. Burgers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these books back here, I mean, one of my my core values is improvement obsession, and so that's literally why I wrote a book called Leveling Up. And you know, I don't look at these books as uh, my my coach would ask me this. He's like. He's trying to make a point about me loving to learn. He's like, yeah, like I'm sure like, you know, you have the library back. I'm sure you've read everything. I was like, absolutely not. Um, because I look at this, each of these books as reference points. And so each chapter is a blog post. And when I need to call right. on this knowledge, I can call on it. It's not a, a badge of honor to say, oh, you've read everything here. Like that to me is actually very inefficient. So, yeah. but that's why I have the books. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's reference. And the thing is that you uh, you can't remember all the stuff anyway. I mean, you and I have read books, and then we went back later, and it's all new to us, you know. So <laughs> uh, the uh, that's where Bob Dylan got a lot of the lyrics from in the '60s. He got over in what Allen Ginsberg, whoever the poet was, he let him into his house, became buddies, and he could stay there when Ginsberg was out of town. And he would just flip through things. He said, things got better when I read. I realized you didn't have to read the whole thing. And so yep. he flipped through. He'd, he'd see lines. You know, he was in he was in the storytelling thing and, the you know, looking for lyrics and things like that. So it, it's like a comedian, you know, looking for punchlines and things like that. But a pretty smart way of uh, accumulating uh, uh a lot of material that he turned into some incredible songs. But that's what, uh, you know, the idea is feed your brain, stay stimulated. We only have 24 hours in the day. And as you came up through this thing, how important was it for you? Or did you think, you know, let's just say gaming. Uh, How driven are gamers? You know, I mean, did you... Uh, you know, to you run up those totals and things like that. Is that is that just uh, as important in gaming as it is in sports? Yeah. So it's I don't really look at the score, and so the there's a couple of different ways to look at this. But one, I think what you're you're comparing to is, for example, if you're playing football or if you're playing basketball, at the very end of it, you have one team that wins. It's a zero percent right. game. It's the same thing with competitive gaming too. You have teams five on five, and at the very end, you have a winner versus a loser. Right. Um, and so it, that's that's how you would look at it. And so right. um, I think, I, I, sorry, just how would you could you rephrase your question again? I just I'm worried about the competition and the desire to be to work your way up to the top and to yep. be known uh, as yeah. you know top in your field or somebody yep. who's really worth paying attention to. If you want to be the best in any game, you have to play with the best people. You have to be a part of a team, and the team also has to be really motivated too. It's just like when you go work for like a like a Google or Amazon or something like that. They have certain standards and they have certain values. And so when I remember, I used to play this game called World of Warcraft. We had a team of forty of us, and our guild leader, who's basically our CEO, he would wake everyone up, call everyone up at three a.m. Okay, so. That's how competitive we were. When let's say something popped up where like there's a monster, like a boss that popped up at 3 a.m., he'd be monitoring it. Okay. He'd call everyone on their cell phones. We'd all wake up and we'd get we get in and we'd fight. And there would be a, one of our rival teams that, that was against us. They would be there waiting to fight us, right? And we'd have to kill them first over and over and over. And then once they gave up, then we'd go kill the boss. So when it was all said and done, maybe we're done at five or six a.m. But that's a level of competitiveness. That's a level wow. of drive that you need to win sometimes when you're playing at the top. The word obsession comes in, which uh, if you're going, you know, at, if you're going to build anything special, you're going to turn into anything special. You would, you're going to have to go through at least a phase where you're a monomaniac on a mission. You know, <laughs> you got to you got to do unreasonable things to get unreasonable results. Right, and uh, you. The key word is results. You know, that's how you, you know, look at it. And that's what I like about the gaming thing is you're looking for results. 
And, you know, nobody comes in. And for many of the kids I've seen learning how to play, uh, you know, games, they're not taking a six-month course in how to master the newest game that came out. They get some of the basics, and then they're starting to play and advance that way. You know, they learn by doing. And really, that's how, other than the fundamentals, I've always said that you go to greatness, you got to have fundamentals, got to have fundamentals, but you go to greatness by using the fundamentals. You learn, you learn how those fundamentals work in ways that maybe other people haven't figured out yet. And maybe didn't weren't obvious to you when you started, but you started with the fundamentals, and then magic started to happen, you know. But the magic can't happen to, you know, out of thin air. It has to be by some kind of design. And uh, what I like about your book, uh, the title, you know, I haven't read the book. I just saw the book uh, reading up on your uh, bio. Is the title "Leveling Up"? Mass how to, basically. The way I explained it, and I think we're we're coming at it from the same way, is people like you can never guarantee success. But what I tell people is you can change the odds, you know, and you can start stacking the odds in your from against you to in your favor to where you can put the odds where it's all you're never guaranteed success, but it becomes almost inevitable. And this leveling up thing is what I like about it. Eric, and that what you've tapped into is you can control uh, your situation. You can change those odds. You can cr- increase, you know, your opportunities uh, for or likelihood of being successful uh, by taking action. And that's what uh, it sounded like you were getting at in that title and in, in your book. Is that correct? Would that be right? Yeah. So the book is. It's really an introduction to personal growth and habit building for gamers or for people that have a gaming mindset. And so if you, the one thing you can control or the things that one of the few things you can control in your life are the inputs. And so you choose when to go to bed. You choose if you want to eat healthy. You choose whether you want to train or not. And a lot of those inputs are within your control. And if you keep compounding those inputs over time, then it's pretty... It'd be kind of crazy to assume that you wouldn't have at least results that you're happy with. Right. So but most people give up too easily. They stop. And so that's all it is. It's really just habit building and habit stacking. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealanwinning.com. Thanks for listening.